Hi, you're watching Nursinga. Today we're going to talk about hematology and oncology in the pediatric patient as part of our summer pediatric lecture series. So first with hematology, let's review the components of the blood, right? So plasma is the fluid with all the electrolytes and proteins and everything um, dissolved in it, but then there's cells that are circulating around as well. So we have red blood cells, we have white blood cells, we have platelets, and obviously there's a lot more uh, specific broken down than that, but we're gonna start there. Um, hematopoiesis is the term for blood cell formation, and that includes red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, lymphocytes. This occurs in the bone marrow. So we have what are called pluripotent stem cells or stem cells in the bone marrow that can receive messages from um, hormones within the body that tell the bone marrow what to make. So during times of stress or infection, it's gonna tell the bone marrow to make more white blood cells. And during times of um, anemia or blood loss or decreased oxygenation, it will tell the bone marrow to make more red blood cells. So basically it, it knows what it needs and it sends that feedback. Erythropoiesis is specifically red blood cell formation. This is regulated by the kidneys, and when they sense hypoxia, they secrete a hormone called erythropoietin, which then tells that pluripotent stem cell in the bone marrow to make more red blood cells. Erythrocytes, our red blood cells, carry oxygen and assist with uh, creating clots. Leukocytes, which are white blood cells, fight infection. And thrombocytes, which are platelets, form platelet plugs and kind of initiate the clotting cascade to stop bleeding. You may see in paperwork, especially like when you're looking at uh, discharge paperwork on a patient or um, if you're doing an interfacility transfer, they talk about blood dyscrasia. And that term just means that there's an abnormal lab value um, or an abnormality of the formed cells. So on their lab work, there's something abnormal. The lymphatic system runs parallel to the venous system. It um, absorbs and filters the plasma that was in the interstitial spaces and destroys any pathogens that were picked up in that tissue um, and stimulates antibody production before taking that cleaned plasma and putting it back into the venous system in the central circulation. Lymph adenopathy is the term for an enlargement of lymph nodes, and we see this with infection and the inflammatory process, as well as disease. And our spleen is our largest lymphatic organ. Anemia occurs when there is either not enough or um, an impairment in the function of red blood cells. Uh, so anemia truly is inadequate cellular oxygen supply. So it is a problem with cellular hypoxia due to a red blood cell condition. A hemoglobin less than eight increases uh, cardiac output and blood shunting. So when we have a hemoglobin less than eight for any reason, our body thinks that we are hemorrhaging to death because of this decreased oxygen carrying capacity and it will activate the, um, the sympathetic nervous system. Chronic anemia as well as acute, an acute anemia looks like a pallor and in somebody who has darker pigmentation, you're gonna see pallor on the palate of the mouth, the mucous membranes, um, the uh, conjunctiva in the eyes, the hands of, uh, the palms of your hands, the soles of your feet. Uh, weakness, fatigue, dyspnea on exertion, um, and tachypnea all have uh, common presentations with all of the types of anemia. The one real difference is that our um, destructive anemias, so the hemolytic anemias like uh, thalassemia and sickle cell, 
um, anemia, those also have jaundice from the increased rate of red blood cell destruction, which causes an increase in serum bilirubin. And especially in kids, the immature liver just can't keep up with all of that bilirubin converting it to bile. And so they'll have a rise in their serum bilirubin levels, which will present as that yellow discoloration or jaundice. The most common childhood uh, deficiency as far as anemias go is iron deficiency anemia. And this is related directly to um, poor diet and or bleeding. The treatment is supplementation. It's important to know that iron supplementation makes the stools look dark green and can cause constipation and abdominal pain. We see this um, at the highest peak incidence between nine and 24 months, and then again in adolescence. The progression of the disease is slow if untreated, but in severe cases, the heart muscle becomes too weak to function. Chronic anemia causes delayed physical growth and cognitive impairment. You can see here that some of the common findings on physical exam on a pediatric patient who has um, either lost red blood cells or <clears throat> has um, like, like a chronic GI bleed or um, some sort of chronic disease of the bone marrow or um, a, an anemia would be uh, constant dyskinesia because their cells are always hypoxic. Um, Coelinicus, which is that spoon-shaped fingernail, atrophic glossitis, so kind of this um, smooth, uh, beefy tongue, and then angular chelitis, which is, uh, you know, cracks and irritation in the corners of the mouth. Sickle cell anemia is a disease that we see primarily in African and Mediterranean uh, descent patients. It is autosomal recessive, which means that you need to inherit the gene from both of your parents. Uh, people can be uh, carriers, so they can have um, one gene, uh, or they can have um, the disease where they have both genes. Symptoms don't appear until usually the end of the first year of life, although you can screen for it um, before birth or with newborn screening. So typically what happens is uh, the child gets sick, so they get a, a runny nose or a cough. It's usually a, a viral infection, and that leads to dehydration and fever, and that causes um, the red blood cells to sickle. So what you see here in this picture are the round blood cells that look kind of like little inner tubes, but there's um, they're not holes in the middle. And then we have um, these other cells that have hemoglobin S instead of regular hemoglobin. And when they're exposed to hypoxic or dehydrated environments, they tend to sickle. And so they're shaped more like a canoe. And so just think about it this way. Like if you're going down a windy river, like our blood vessels, would you rather be sitting in this nice little inner tube or would you rather be in this canoe? Um, so and when you're in the inner tube, you're just going to kind of bump off of things and keep going. Um, and normal hemoglobin or red blood cells are very flexible, but red blood cells that have this hemoglobin S turn into this kind of pointier shape and then they get caught and they can't flex and bend and then they clump up and they create clots. Um, so they tend to create clots in areas where there's small blood vessels. So like the eyes, um, the kidneys, the different organs, the end of the fingers and the toes. And um, also in the spleen, that's possible as well. So these little microscopic obstructions occur, which cause ischemia to the surrounding tissues and then um, it can cause infarction, so tissue death, and then necrosis and impaired organ function. So for us, um, anytime we have a patient who has a sickle cell crisis, uh, we want to focus on hydration and oxygenation and liberal pain management. This is incredibly painful uh, for people who are experiencing a sickle cell crisis.
this is just another picture um, <clears throat> but I think it's important to really understand the mechanism and why it's so painful so it's kind of like somebody has put a tourniquet or um, you know like instead of having a heart attack you're having an infarct of a different organ um, so that you know instant kind of cessation of blood flow is incredibly painful to people um, children with sickle cell disease oftentimes have immunosuppression and that um, puts them at risk for frequent bacterial infections so um, you know a, a respiratory infection like a pneumonia or sepsis is the leading cause of death in young children with sickle cell disease Caregivers are taught to call for help as soon as there's any evidence of a respiratory or skin infection um, because they want to get treatment before a lot of these cells have sickled. Strokes occur in about 5 to 10 percent of children with sickle cell disease, and this can lead to neurodevelopmental delay and cognitive impairment. So when this um, clumping occurs in a vessel leading to an organ, we get what's called a vaso-occlusive crisis. This is probably the most common reason that we'll get called because it's extremely painful. And um, usually this presents with fever, pain in the area of the occlusion. So if it's in the belly, they're gonna have abdominal pain. Um, you know, if it's in the, the heart, they'll have chest pain. If it's in the head, they'll have stroke-like symptoms. Um, things like leg pain, stiff neck, muscle spasms, swollen joints, tissue enlargement, vomiting, and even blood in the urine are all common. This can lead to seizures, stroke, coma, and paralysis. And a vaso-occlusive crisis can be fatal. Um, the spleen can get what's called sequestered. So if there's clumping of the spleen, this can become life-threatening and death can occur within just a few hours. Blood pools in the spleen causing profound anemia, hypovolemia, and shock. So it's essentially a hemorrhagic shock that's occurring inside the body. And then the last thing that occurs with sickle cell disease is what's called an aplastic crisis. And this is where there's diminished production and increased destruction of red blood cells, um, usually triggered by a viral infection or um, a lack of folic acid or adequate building blocks to make red blood cells. And so when that happens, the child will experience kind of a sudden onset of uh, profound anemia and pallor. And so they'll have pretty severe uh, signs and symptoms of anemia. Thalassemia um, is a chronic anemia. And this also um, is an, like kind of a congenital um, genetic trait. It can occur from a spontaneous mutation, um, but when you have thalassemia, your body can't make kind of adult or mature hemoglobin, and that leads to chronic anemia. Thalassemia minor is considered beta thalassemia trait, and it's inherited from one parent, and the child experiences minor signs and symptoms and minor anemia. Thalassemia major, also referred to as Cooley's anemia, is when you inherit the gene from both parents and you have progressive severe anemia. Um, the onset is uh, at about six months. It's very evident by six months of age. The child will have pallor, hypoxia, poor appetite, fever, jaundice from that increased red blood cell destruction, um, bronze coloration of the skin. This is called hemosiderosis. So when we break down red blood cells rapidly, we end up with the heme or the iron staining the skin. Um, the liver and the spleen become enlarged. We get abdominal distension and pressure on the chest organs. There's a massive bone marrow space enlargement, which changes the facial contour. So uh, what you see here is a very classic facial presentation of thalassemia major, which is Cooley's anemia. And then the child can also develop heart failure from this type of anemia. The patients are treated with frequent blood transfusions, which results in a lot of, um, again, red blood cell destruction and iron deposits in the tissues. And so they also might get treated with Desferol, which is a iron chelating agent, and it's given to counteract hemosiderosis. 
Um, I wanted to just mention this because iron is the number one overdose and poisoning in kids. And so if you have um, a child who has uh, taken, you know, Flintstones with iron or whatever because they tasted like candy, um, they're going to need an iron chelating agent. So Desperol is the, the drug of choice. And then with thalassemia, sometimes we need a splenectomy uh, as well because of all of the um, kind of buildup of uh, the byproducts and the spleen sometimes is just uh, overactive in its destruction of those immature uh, hemoglobin based red blood cells. And so removal of the spleen can help decrease the severity of the disease. Any time someone has their spleen removed, however, they are at lifelong risk of infection since that was our big lymphatic organ. If you work in a hospital or um, if you're participating in an interfacility transfer of a child receiving blood products, there are some key things that you need to know. So first of all, there are rules that differ state by state on who can and cannot uh, witness and initiate blood products. So follow the protocols for identifying the patient and the blood. Uh, blood can only be infused through a blood filter tubing and it is only compatible with normal saline. We never add medications to blood. So one of the things you need to know is if you're doing a transfer and you're, this kid is getting blood, you have to have a separate IV line. Um, so nothing is compatible other than normal saline with blood. Vital signs should be taken per protocol, uh, and typically transfusion reactions occur within the first 15 minutes of starting the transfusion. But <clears throat> um, you know, if you have a child who's sick enough to be doing a, getting a blood transfusion, you probably want to be doing vital signs um, every five minutes. Signs and symptoms of a transfusion reaction include chills, itching, rash, fever, headache, and back or kidney pain. Um, if you suspect that your patient is having a reaction to the transfusion, immediately stop it. Disconnect the blood and the saline that was spiked with the saline, and then spike a new bag with saline and fresh tubing and bolus it in or flush it in. Notify the physician and the hospital blood bank. Um, usually they'll ask for the blood bag uh, back to do further testing on it. Um, and just so you know, every transfusion we do, we have to turn in um, all of the um, the little tubes and the bag that were attached uh, to the patient. So all of the empty units go back to the blood bank for testing. When you um, add red blood cells directly into the bloodstream, like a transfusion, that has a really high oncotic pulling pressure. So that's gonna draw in a lot of additional fluid into that intravascular space. And this is a concern for both children and our elderly adults, especially those that have underlying like heart disease. So fluid volume overload is definitely in danger. So you wanna listen for crackles, look for uh, jugular vein distension, look for evidence of difficulty breathing. So dyspnea, any chest pain, crackles on auscultation, any changes in color like cyanosis, um, a dry cough or distended neck veins would tell us that this child has too much volume now. Um, in the hospital, we frequently uh, use Lasix in between units of blood to help decrease some of that intravascular volume while keeping the red blood cells in uh, the blood vessels. So we don't really have that um, ability in the field. So, you know, in that case, we might slow down the transfusion um, or, uh, you know, stop any other fluids that are running at the same time and alert the receiving facility. Um, always be prepared to administer medications if the patient does have a reaction, like, you know, epinephrine if it's anaphylaxis or Benadryl if there's a rash. Um, and then uh, supplemental oxygen also is really important if there's any sort of a reaction to the transfusion. And I would argue that a patient getting a transfusion because they have decreased oxygen carrying capacity probably should be on oxygen anyway. So moving on now to hemophilia, this is a sex-linked um, 
and it's X-linked, so it's uh, from the mother recessive trait. Females are carriers and males are affected. There's variable severity. Um, about one third of cases are new mutations, so there's no family history in about a third of our cases, and symptoms often don't occur until about six months of age. So once the child is able to toddle around, um, so once they become mobile, this leads to injuries from falls and accidents, and that's where you notice like, hey, my kid won't stop bleeding. There's different types of hemophilia. So hemophilia A is referred to as classic hemophilia, and this is a deficiency of factor eight. And 80% of cases um, are hemophilia A, and, and about one in 5,000 males are affected. Hemophilia B, also referred to as Christmas disease, is caused by a deficiency of factor nine, and that's only about 15% of cases. And then there's other things, there's other uh, rare types, and there's uh, von Willebrand's disease, things like that. Um, so basically hemophilia is a bleeding disorder um, from a clotting factor deficiency, regardless of the type, and patients who have hemophilia tend to get um, they bruise easily, so they have ecchymosis, uh, they bleed easily, so epistaxis, and then prolonged bleeding. And one of the things you need to know is that um, if you can't clot, even if it's a small injury, you could bleed to death. So I know it sounds strange, but even just like a teeny tiny lip injury um, could end up being a um, you know life-threatening uh, constant drip, drip, drip if it's not taken care of. Hemarthrosis is when we bleed into a joint. Um, so the knees, the elbows, the ankles, um, even shoulders, those are kind of the prime spaces for bleeding and that leads to impaired mobility. Even minor trauma, tooth extractions and minor surgeries can lead to significant bleeding after the procedure. Large subcutaneous and intramuscular hemorrhages might occur, and then bleeding into like the neck, the chest, the mouth, the airway, all of those can compromise airway management and patient stability. Um, patients with hemophilia also have an increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage, um, and so if they experience trauma where they hit their head, they should be evaluated. If you're responding to a school for a kiddo with hemophilia who like fell on the playground and they smacked like let's just say their knee, um, the concern at that point in time is hemarthrosis, right? So there's no external bleeding, but um, they have bleeding into the joint space. So during acute episodes, you're going to immobilize that joint just like you would uh, any other time that knee was injured. Um, you're going to check distal CSMTs, pre and post immobilization. And then we're also going to use the RICE mnemonic. So um, immobilization provides us with rest. We're going to ice it to decrease bleeding. And when we ice, we have vasoconstriction and that helps promote clotting and uh, it decreases blood flow to that area. So we want to ice it really well. Um, you can put ice above and below the knee, kind of like pack the knee in ice, um, just keeping in mind to have a barrier between the ice pack and the skin. Compression, if you have an ACE wrap, uh, compression is awesome. Again, checking CSMTs before and after. So we don't want to compress to the point of no blood flow. And then elevation. So get this kid in the position of comfort as far as the chest and the, the head and the neck go and then elevate that extremity um, to uh, facilitate you know, a decrease of swelling, but also to kind of slow down blood flow to the knee. And then analgesics, and analgesics are going to be things like acetaminophen and opiates. We are not going to use Tordal or aspirin, um, no NSAIDs ever for pain in the patient with hemophilia. They may have some of their own medications like Amicar or DDAVP, which is Desmopressin, and these two drugs promote clotting. So they help create a clot. So DDAVP, which is probably the more common one that you'll, come, you'll see, comes as like a pill or nasal spray, um, and it increases factor eight activity by two to four times. Um, if the person has epistaxis, the nasal spray can help stop bleeding, um, but also sometimes uh, if they have hemophilia and they're participating in sports, they may take it kind of prophylactically before they play. Tranexamic acid or TXA, 
uh, we could use. And TX8 does not promote clotting, but it stabilizes existing clots. So um, you need to make sure that you've done all the other things, you know, direct pressure if it's an external bleed, and then the rice um, if it's uh, internal injury um, before you give uh, TXA. And then clotting factors. So some people have clotting factors that they can either infuse or inject or bring with them to the hospital for uh, infusion once they arrive. Um, so again, uh, avoid NSAIDs. For superficial bleeding, you're going to need to apply pressure for a minimum of 15 minutes along with ice for vasoconstriction. And um, if you can't uh, stop it, then we would continue on. If there's any significant bleeding, then um, you want to, you know, elevate your response and use our hemostatic gauze um, or TXA. Other conditions that cause bleeding disorders include things like ITP, which is idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. And the exact cause of this is unknown, but it's an acquired hemorrhagic disorder um, where the platelets are coated with an antibody and destroyed in the spleen. Um, so this is excessive destruction of platelets due to an antiplatelet antibody. Um, and they think that this is probably triggered by either um, medications or a viral infection. So typically the onset is right after a viral, viral infection and it's self-limiting. It usually resolves on its own within four to six months. Um, so during that time, we treat them as if they had hemophilia and we try to avoid anything that could cause bleeding. Um, it's not uncommon to see uh, purpura, so kind of petechiae, um, or petechiae that have kind of merged together to cause that purpuric echomotic type of rash. Um, during the active phase, we want to avoid drugs that interfere with platelet function like aspirin or NSAIDs, um, avoid rectal temps or anything that could cause trauma, and avoid IM injections. Um, it is difficult to distinguish sometimes between the bruising that you see with ITP and child abuse. So just another reason to document factually and not accuse. So let's talk now about cancers. So we're going to talk about leukemia and lymphoma. Leukemia is um, a kind of broad group uh, or kind of a catch-all umbrella term for malignant diseases of the bone marrow and the lymphatic system, which presents with this uncontrolled or like out of control production of immature white blood cells. And because the white blood cells are released into the bloodstream before they can mature, they don't have any infection fighting capabilities. So they have what's called leukocytosis or way too many white blood cells with no defense mechanisms. The fact that the pluripotent stem cell is always selecting for white blood cells also means that it is not selecting for or creating an adequate amount of red blood cells or platelets. And so then the patient becomes chronically anemic from not making enough red blood cells and they have a high risk of bleeding because they don't have enough platelets. Because their white blood cells don't function, they also have a really high risk for infection. And so um, our main concern is what's called protective isolation. So we wanna clean our equipment really well before we use it, minimize needle sticks or any invasive procedures that would create a, a portal of entry for infection. Um, and then we want to wear uh, gloves, meticulous hand hygiene and masks so that if we do have any sort of a cold or anything, we don't share it with them. Um, organs like the spleen, the liver, and the lymph glands uh, can become enlarged, and um, leukemia also can impact the central nervous system. It is treated with chemotherapy, radiation, and or a bone marrow transplant. Um, the patient is kept in an outpatient setting whenever possible, so they stay with their own germs and not constantly being exposed to new things. Um, and the main side effects of the chemotherapy and radiation are fatigue, generalized weakness, loss of appetite, and weight loss. Um, so 
medications like Zofran tend to be fairly effective in minimizing nausea and vomiting so that the person can eat. Um, this is the most common form of childhood cancer. So about 50% of all childhood cancers are leukemias and the peak onset is between two and six years of age, uh, which makes this you know, fairly devastating diagnosis. Lymphoma, on the other hand, is um, a cancer of the lymphatic nodes, um, and it presents as a painless lump. Um, so the difference between an inflammatory or a reactive node is that those tend to be swollen and tender. Um, a, uh, a cancerous node is firm and kind of fixed to the underlying tissue and it's not painful at all. Any child who has a, um, a lump or a, a swelling like this above the clavicle needs to be evaluated for lymphoma. There are very few other manifestations just because it doesn't um, tend to, you know, obstruct anything uh, because the lymphatic tissue is closer to the surface. Um, but in more advanced cases, the child may have uh, fevers, anorexia, so loss of appetite, um, weight loss, night sweats, general malaise, so they're tired, um, and even a rash or some itching. There's two types of lymphoma. There's Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And the diagnosis is a biopsy of the lymph node. And when they look at the slide, so the biopsy um, under the microscope, Hodgkin's lymphoma has these Reed-Sternberg cells and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma does not have Reed-Sternberg cells. Um, so the difference is that Hodgkin's lymphoma usually presents in a very predictable pattern, um, usually starting in the upper body with those swollen, painless nodes. Again, weight loss, night sweats, persistent fever, malaise. Um, they can get a cough, shortness of breath, and chest pain if they have nodes within the mediastinum or the chest. And then recurrent infections uh, because the lymphatic tissue is impaired. Um, as well as itching, that pruritus, and an enlarged spleen. Hodgkin's lymphoma is more prevalent in children between 15 and 19 years of age. And the treatment is radiation and chemotherapy. Um, <clears throat> so uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma has poor outcomes. So Hodgkin's lymphoma, because it's so predictable and easy to recognize, um, has a really um, good long-term prognosis. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is usually metastatic before it is discovered because the spread is so disorganized, it kind of goes all over the place. It has overall the same signs and symptoms, but not in a predictable pattern. So again, you're going to biopsy the nodes, they'll stage the progression, they'd manage it with chemotherapy and radiation, um, surgery as well to remove um, infected or involved nodes, not infected, but involved nodes. Uh, again, prognosis is better for Hodgkin's lymphoma than non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, the presence of HIV and immunosuppression increase the risk of developing lymphoma. And so a child who has HIV or other forms of uh, immunosuppression or someone who is taking medications for, you know, idiopathic juvenile um, arthritis, what, you know, like juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, or uh, who was receiving treatment for leukemia may develop lymphoma. So obviously we won't be administering chemotherapy in the field, but we'll definitely be taking care of patients receiving chemotherapy. Um, so it's important to know that chemotherapeutic agents cause things like nausea, diarrhea, rash, hair loss, fever, decreased urination, anemia, and bone marrow depression. So they'll have a decrease in their white blood cells, their red blood cells, and platelets. Um, so other side effects would be things like peripheral neuropathy, constipation due to decreased nerve sensations in the bowel. And then uh, because they're oftentimes on steroids as well um, to kind of bat down the immune system, um, we know that steroids 
increase glucose levels, they mask signs of infection, they cause significant fluid retention, um, they can induce personality changes, and long term they can cause like a moon shaped face, uh, you know, like a, a Cushing's disease. Um, we need to anticipate the need for antiemetics and the pro like primary problem of uh, dehydration. So again, Zofran can be used safely for nausea. And radiation. So radiation um, sometimes can be curative, but with uh, lymphomas, um, it's usually just provides symptomatic relief. Um, and, uh, you know, debulking. So the combination of the chemotherapy, the radiation, and the surgery can be curative. Um, if the person has side effects of radiation, those tend to be um, severe fatigue and then just things like, you know, skin irritation um, at the site of radiation. Um, the patient does not become radioactive during or after therapy. You don't require any specific or special isolation, um, and you can't get sick from being near them. And then, you know, anytime we're dealing with uh, terminal children or end of life with pediatrics, I think it's always important that we also think about our own need for support and renewal and just taking time um, for ourselves and uh, thinking about how we can kind of um, I guess decompress and take care of our own mental health all right that is it thank you so much for watching the hematology and oncology information and I uh, hope you enjoyed it I'll see you next time